This show contains violence and adult language. Howdy folks, I'm Caleb Sunstead, your host and game marshal. I normally run the actual play podcast Sounds Like Crows, which is a Deadlands Reloaded actual play podcast. But right now we're about to do a one shot, which will be a few different episodes here. Testing out the new rules for Deadlands updated to Savage Worlds Adventure Edition. I'm so excited to be joined here by all of the Crow boys. Cameron Day, how are you? I'm doing excellent. Uh, What character are you playing for us today? I'm going to be playing the Mystic. Mysterious Kane. He's going to be a rough and tumble sort of knife wielding badass. Hell yeah. Alex Horror, what are you playing for us? Oh, wow, 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 wow. Okay, wow, so wow. I'm going to be playing Grant Hildebrand. He's a Hexlinger. He's also part of the Explorer Society. And then we have Isaac Sunstead. What are you playing for us, man? I'm going to be playing Dolores Day. She's a Texas Ranger who just got back from her studies at Oxford. Oh, wow. Fancy Texas Ranger. Marshall Sims. Yeah, hello, everyone. I am. Uh, playing Doc Soren Erickson. He's uh, an elderly mad scientist with a, a small fascination with uh, creatures and critters of all kinds. Cameron Reed, who are you playing? I'm playing John Boudreau. He's an agent uh, from New Orleans, and he's coming out here to uh, investigate what's going on. Excellent. Well, I'm excited to get in it with these characters. Anything we need to let the audience know about? I don't think so. Let's play some Deadlands. Yes. Yeehaw. We open with the hollow, echoing tick of a grandfather clock that fills up this room in the Explorer's Society. It's musty and too big for the amount of people that should be in here. There are shelves on the wall that are too empty. There's uh, little bits and bobs of mechanical contraptions that have been created by the locals, along with a few uh, taxidermied animals. Uh, But I think with the one that sort of the camera pulls to uh, as it pans along one of these shelves is a jackalope a large jackrabbit with antlers attached. We get a shot of its dead, hollow, taxidermied eyes before we hear someone clear their throat in the background. We switch to a wide shot of this almost conference-looking room. It smells a bit of dust and whiskey, and there's a long, old mahogany table uh, that could seat 20, but is currently sitting 5. Half of the table is covered in clutter, little sections that almost look like workstations of gears and springs and all sorts of mechanisms, different mechanical creations in different stages of construction or perhaps deconstruction. And the camera dollies on this table past this clutter towards the group of people. One figure stands at the end of the table. Uh, what do they look like, Alex? Uh, it's a young man. He looks pretty rough around the edges. He's wearing a like a cowhide short topped hat. The brim is like medium length, but the edges kind of curl up a little bit. And he's got a leather band that goes around the top of it with some rounds of ammunition kind of tucked in there. He's fairly handsome. He just has a perpetual five o'clock shadow, no matter what time of day it is, and no matter when the last time he shaved was. He's wearing a um, button-down gray shirt tucked into his trousers, and of course he's got a dusty leather jacket over that. Uh, his belt is uh, nothing nothing crazy, just a, a simple leather belt, along with his boots and trousers, both very simple. Um, but he's, he's standing at the end of this table, and he's got kind of this paper unrolled with what looks to be some sort of map or something on there. All right, gentlemen and lady, uh, what have you been told already? Just what was in my telegram, I assume? Just what you sent in your letter. The camera cuts over to a man in his late 30s. He's seated at one of these chairs around this table, kind of in repose. Um, He's wearing a black duster um, with a red vest and a white shirt underneath. He looks like a man who hasn't slept in days, maybe weeks. His skin's a little pale, his eyes are a little sunken with deep, dark circles around them. He's got longer black hair that is brushed back and a small, modest mustache. As he's seated, you can see a almost blonde leather belt that holds two shiny black pistols at his waist. I am interested to see what else you have for us here. It was an awfully long journey and I am quite excited to get into the meat and potatoes, as it were. 
seated across from him is a, a younger woman, perhaps in her, her mid-twenties. Her hair is done very sensibly uh, back, and she is pointedly wearing a bowler hat indoors. Uh, she has a sort of a gray, it's as close to a pantsuit as you'd get in this time period. And uh, she nods. That's right. And then primly puts her hands together on the table in front of her, waiting for someone else to speak. As the woman folds her hands in her lap and sits back, she bumps uh, a small, frail old man. It looks to be in his 70s. He's got himself a bright leather apron over just some standard maroon shirt. Looks weathered and a little oily in places. He's got oil smeared across his, uh, his wrinkled old face. Uh, he's got hardly any hair on top, a little bit of salt and pepper, and one long, wispy beard that hangs beneath his chin. Uh, he bumps into her and drops part of a contraption he's been uh, tinkering with at the table. Oh, oh damn it! Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, miss. I wasn't paying attention. Are we You're referring to the, the explosion, yes? Yeah, we're referring to the explosion. All right, well, listen, I would need this for my equipment and the project, so uh, w- what did you have in mind for us to do? I was just asking what everybody knew already. Just well, to, surely just they so we're all seem, on the same page here. If that's what you put in your letter, that's well, what... It's a telegram, but... They are the ones who've received your message, yes? What are you getting at here, Doc? Well, get on with it then. What's our plan from here? I just wanted to make sure everybody was on the same page, okay? That's all I'm trying to do here. Well, I frankly do not know much. It was a telegram after all, and well, that... word of mouth, you know, you hear things. We're, we're, you know. Only the impolite ears hear things that are not destined for them, sir. Pretty sure there was some epitaph reporters here, too, if I'm not mistaken. And you think that I would ever believe and or read the epitaph in the first place? It's a strange thing for a uh, Explorer Society member to say. <laughs> are you, uh, did are I you, immediately out are myself? You, <laughs> yeah, I think you did. You may have outed yourself, Cameron. Yeah. Uh, so the Explorer Society is, um, how would you describe it? I think that a majority of their members are kind of like your stereotypical like monster hunters. The average member. Yeah, they were like the big game hunters elitist club. But they hunt. Yeah, there's two ways to get into the Explorer Society. You either have to buy your way in, or an existing member kind of has to refer you in if you have a, a set of skills they think might be useful to the society. They hunt the things that would be reported in the epitaph that no one believes, but they're the guys that are hunting them. So they're the guys out there hunting jackalopes and Bigfoots and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And the epitaph is, of course, a newspaper publication a set out of Tombstone, I believe. Yeah, it's like a tabloid kind of thing. We get a shot of John's face, and it doesn't turn red, but the expression on his face is like one of like, oh, you know, (laughs) I goofed a little bit, you know, and uh, we stay on your face, but the camera shot changes. So the lighting changes and the background changes and you're in your office where uh, a letter is put down on your desk. And then uh, the person that dropped it, we don't even see their face as they walk away and go, hey, you got new orders, John. And then they slam down another letter and then uh, hustle off to keep distributing mail to the rest of the agency. John, we see you sort of pick up this letter and instead of the garb uh, you were wearing in this uh, Explorer Society, you're wearing a black duster, the uniform of the U.S. Agency, a uh, organization a bit like the CIA or the FBI of the Weird West, intent on controlling the spread of shall we say, the paranormal. I mean, I say they're more like the men in black. Yes. Trying to keep all this stuff secret more than anything. They don't want the common people of the world or of America to find out that there are, you know, nightmares roaming around. So we see this shot of John picking up the letter, opening it up with a finger, and then uh, reading the contents as we cut back to uh, this compromising situation in the Explorer Society. Well, we don't exactly get the epitaph in New Orleans, and I dare say it does not have the greatest reputation. Let's roll Persuasion, Cameron, versus, I think, Spirit, Alex, and let's see uh, how well this deception goes. I'm not sure we normally do versus rolls like this, but I think in this context it makes sense. What'd you get? I got a one. Oh, I got a three. <laughs> I know that something's like a little off maybe with that. I didn't get yeah. a raise. Right. right. 
Yeah, I think a success telling something is off makes sense. It would be hard for you to make the leap that he was an agent, you know. Maybe he's less experienced than you think he is. Maybe he knows more than he thinks he is. The third option I'll give you is maybe you think he's like a, a scout for the Explorer Society, like he's seen what your chapter is like, you know. I might even think he's just some rich kid that just like bought his way in and has no yes. experience with this stuff yet. But you know something is off, and I think the more lies uh, Agent John is going to have to make eventually you might put it together the scene is interrupted as a flask is pulled up and put to the mouth of a gruff well-built gentleman by weathered beaten hands covered in scars these are hands that have seen war these are hands that have taken lives as he pulls from this flask the flask drips whiskey all over his white pinstripe shirt over his suspenders the eyes of this sunken man and defeated man are broken as he gruffs out the words. I thought it was just for money. Well, for you it is, probably. Then why are we all here? I figure we might need some help if Wharton uh, hears about what we're doing. Now, Grant, you didn't mention all this shit. Well, I'm about to now. Do you want the money or not? Yeah. That's what I thought. Now, John, everybody's had a first time in the field, okay? It's nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> How about you, Dolores? She looks over at him. A first time in the field as such, yes. First time in the field as in practice and experience? Uh, no, I've had a lot of experience. She seems to almost be trying to convince herself of this. Well, from the reports that I've been hearing from the townsfolk, you're in for quite the treat. What I got here is a map of uh, a mine owned by a man named Clarence Wharton. About a month ago, there was a sizable explosion. I don't know what other way to describe it. What do you, what do you think, Doc? Uh, yes, the, the, uh, the rabble around town was quite an explosion. Uh, they believe it was the ghost rock somehow ignited and uh, blew out a whole cavern. Ghost rock is known to be extremely volatile. Yes, yes, and uh, a great source of energy. I don't know about great, but she looks a little bit sheepish. Your eyes go to this small automaton, which is uh, moving on the table like one of those wind-up toys that can barely walk, you know? Uh, but the whole time, there's sort of a high-pitched signature screaming uh, that comes with ghost rock. Just a little amount of it is burning in this creature, so it's not very loud. But when we get a close-up shot, it's like a high-pitched voice screaming for mercy in the distance. Out of what looks like a little clockwork gecko. I've got, like, some lights that try to flicker on and off in time with the screaming. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and it just waddles across the countertop. I think as it comes over to John, he kind of, like, leans forward slowly and just reaches a hand underneath its belly and, like, with one movement, flips it over and, until it stops moving. And he just leans back in his seat. I think you expect it to stop moving, but it goes on its back and then just starts, like, uh... <laughs> like, uh, like wriggling, yeah. flailing. It tries uh. to like wiggle its hips against its shoulders, <laughs> and it's got its arms back. It's got some good, uh, you know, actuating arms actually. Well, how respectful! I'll be sure not to take care of your equipment in the future. John just kind of rolls his eyes. Well, I have heard of the explosion. I don't know of anybody who hasn't. It was heard several states out. Well, that's just the beginning, my friend. It gets much better. There's been reports by some of the miners of a. Uh, large creatures down below the earth on some of the deepest parts that were blown out by this explosion. Now, uh, Wharton is not too keen on people going down in his mind. He's got a lot of power and he's got a lot of people here. And uh, if he catches wind of us going in there, there's going to be trouble. That's why I wanted you guys here with us. Now, uh, I had a colleague of mine once went down to South America. Down there, they found this sinkhole miles wide, hundreds and hundreds of feet deep. And when they traversed their way down to the bottom, they found plants and animals that they'd never seen before that didn't exist on the, uh, the surface level. So it's my hypothesis, I guess. Is that the right word, Doc? I believe it is, yes. Well, it's my hypothesis that maybe there's some creatures trapped down there below the earth. And maybe this, uh, this explosion has kind of opened up a, a tunnel to this undiscovered world. I missed my chance once. They found it in South America and I was in the Galapagos. But this time, this time, we will get the funding we need. This will be a great discovery, I'm sure we- Kane sits forward in his chair and it squeaks oh. underneath his weight. What the hell makes you think anything like what's in South America is here? I agree. 
I feel like that is quite the leap to make. We have several eyewitnesses. It's got to be worth checking out, right? That's what we do here. Of yes, course absolutely. it's worth checking out. I merely suggest that we may be dealing with something more trivial like Tommy Knockers or possible ghoul. They have been known to hide in caves for extended periods of time and come out when things tend to go wrong. I that assumed was our that wouldn't too. be a problem for you. That's why we sent out these messages in the first place. And the I descriptions, am. they just sound nothing like ghouls or tommy knockers. They were large creatures. Oh, listen. If they're willing to complain and not go with us, we leave them here and we'll go ourselves. Nobody was complaining. And John kind of sits up in his chair, simply asking the questions that need to be asked. Ghouls, tommy knockers. What the fuck is any of this talk? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention. Kane here is not part of the uh, Explorer Society, in case you didn't pick that up. <laughs> Dolores looks over. What on earth would allow a non-member to attend a meeting such as this? Well, he has uh, my endorsement, as well as... I can personally vet for him. I've seen him for several months. Got some pretty uh, useful skills, I think you'll find. I certainly would appreciate him being around. Wait, Doc, you're also thinking about going... Well, of course, I need to be there to document the findings. Well, why wouldn't you go on the second team after we cleared it out? I can't risk that taking long. I need to see it for myself. Jesus Christ, so you're saying that we're going to bring Doc along and these greenhorns? Oh, I won't be alone. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the old man sort of like picks himself up from the table and slowly turns around, gets out of his chair, and walks over to what looks like a, a large rag and a big lump in the corner of the room. He pulls it back. I'll be bringing this with us. The fuck is that? Her name is Peggy. Doesn't really answer the question there, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be perfectly safe is what I'm trying to say. We can go. We can go quickly. And we can be out. Listen, I know he doesn't look like much, but he's worth his ghost rock, I'll tell you that much. Is that an animated mechanical turtle? Well, of course. And he sort of reaches and uh, sticks his fingers in both its nose or its nostrils, and it lights up and starts to scream and walk around, and all the clockwork rotates inside this large tortoise shell of a uh, machine. Doc, I don't know if you've ever been to the field, but more often than not, we need to move quickly. Yes, I understand. Listen, this thing will help us get there, no trouble. That is a, a, a turtle. They are known to be slow. Can you please explain to me this machine? Dolores is nodding along in agreement. It's a fair question. Well, as you can see here, with the ghost rock power that I'm requiring, I'll be able to charge this thing for days. And what it can do is it'll emit a large field that can protect us from any sort of damage. I've been working on it for months, almost a year now. And if I, I won't do it now, I think it can actually affect the rate of time on a person. That is the power of this ghost rock. That is what I'm going for. I would love to see that. We cut to the upside down mechanical thing on the table still flailing. <laughs> Any other questions? Dolores like starts to raise her hand and then realizes as she looks around, this is not an environment where people raise their hands before <laughs> they speak. So she just quickly pulls it back down to her lap. Uh, yes, sir. Where will the uh, spoils of the adventure go? Well, to the Explorer Society, of course. If there are any oh, spoils, what yes, makes you think there's going to yes, be spoils? Yes, of course. You well, mean Ghost Rock? No, I'm not particularly interested in the Ghost Rock uh, varieties. I'm more interested in just, you know, the general learning. Ah, uh, gotcha. Well, if, if we find any specimens of these creatures that they've been mentioning, if we can capture or kill any of them, I suggest we turn them over to the Explorer Society so that more research can be done on them, perhaps. Absolutely. I would oversee uh, a whole department devoted to checking this out. I'm sure that would get lots of money. I'm sure it would look good for all of us, too. Sponsorships, more of you coming out, and a reward unto itself. A doctor? You do go by doctor, is that correct? That's right. Uh, just one question. Where, where did you earn your degree, sir? Uh, well... <laughs> we cut to a darkened desk with the doctor laboriously forging a diploma and then come back. <laughs> yeah it has been some time i did some studying in chicago i was abroad in new york oh i'm yeah, sure I, I am quite far from home i must be honest with you the fuck's with all the questions what makes you so important my dear sir I have just recently graduated with my degree in anthropological studies. I'm here as part of the documentation efforts that will be ongoing for our university studies. 
I'm here to bring a new level of academic rigor. Jesus Christ, Grant. You're going to bring her along? Oh, so you're who I'll be working with. I'm sure you would be a maker for a great assistant. She glares at him. (laughs) Sir, I have assisted in surgery centers in Paris, Berlin, and London. I do not need your dirty backwoods dustbin mechanical contraption messing with my specimen gathering. We're on the same (laughs) side here, guys. We are absolutely on the same side. The side of learning and knowledge, she glares at the doctor. That's right. Although I do not think we will be finding any anthropological uh, specimens down there. I hope not. She raises her eyebrow. You, sir, are an anthropological specimen. Well, study away. (laughs) She's very upset by that comment. Anyways, if there's no other questions, I figure we head out tomorrow. There's a, a few entrances to this mine. I talked to some of the uh, the guys down there at the bar, got some information. There's one that's not too heavily guarded. I figure we uh, enter there maybe. Um, in the meantime, we've got plenty of space here and not very many people to fill it. And uh, we've got a mess hall. It's stocked. Nothing fancy, but you're welcome to help yourself. That is awfully kind of you lot. Dolores tips her hat. Indeed. Texas hospitality has never disappointed me. I'll be at the bar. I'll be there all night. Get me in the morning. Uh, You know what, Kane? I'll go with you. All right, Doc. Fetch the turtle and let's go. (laughs) Always a pleasure, Kane. There's an old frail snap of his finger to the turtle as it sort of whirs around. It's actually kind of quiet for how large it is, but it starts to stomp in behind us. Well, uh, I thank both of you for coming here, and especially on such short notice. I hope that we actually find some stuff down there, if all these reports are correct. I think that we're in for quite the uh, exciting expedition down there. Well, I do guarantee that we will find something of interest down there. I do hope it is as exciting as you have made it out to be. Well, to be honest, I've been pent up in this lodge for almost a year now, and... I'm itching to get out there, regardless of what's in those mines. Oh, I completely understand. Most of my degree uh, for the last year was spent in very dusty libraries, and let me tell you, I'm ready to get back out here. Well, if you need anything, uh, I think I'm going to go grab some food myself from the mess hall, Uh, and I kind of get up start walking away from the table, and then I I turn back and I snap my fingers a couple times, and a very large... Irish wolfhound that was laying beneath this table this whole time gets up and uh, follows me as I walk out the door. As the dog makes it to the door, it sniffs the air a few times and looks back towards the two figures still sat at the table. A small growl emanates from its throat before Grant snaps his fingers with a light whistle and the dog follows begrudgingly. And then it's just Dolores and John left sitting in this room, looking across from each other. With the sound of a clock ticking. She smiles at him, and it's obvious to him, and I think to most other folks, that she's getting to the edge of her, like, she's, she's been on good behavior for a while now, and she's getting to the edge of breaking as she smiles at him. Will you not be joining the other gentleman for a nightcap? Do not believe that I will. She arches an eyebrow. Miss Day, where did you say you were from? Oh, not too far from here, about 300 miles north. You know, I am happy to see that the folks from Texas are so interested in the Explorer Society, considering how large your territory is. Her eyes narrowed just the briefest hint. Indeed. We have uh, always been interested in what goes on within our borders and those of our sister states, and it falls to a few of us to keep an eye on those things. John kind of cracks a grin. Not as few as you'd think. You know, there are plenty of people around here who are quite interested to see what exactly goes on in these parts. Lots of open space to get lost in. Lots of open space to explore. She nods and uh, kind of idly draws a pattern with her fingers on the on the tabletop as she kind of stares off into the distance. My family ranch is uh, is as I said near here, and you know it's but eight thousand acres, and you know I would just get lost for days out there. John starts to stand begrudgingly. He puts his hands on the table and kind of lifts himself up with a sigh. He makes his way towards the door and kind of glances back. Funny. And then he turns and starts walking out the room. 
As he leaves, she waits another beat until everyone's out of sight and then visibly deflates with all this energy that she's been putting into being this kind of perfect persona. Uh, and then she pulls a, a small, very freshly bound book out of the bag that's at her side and starts furiously taking notes. <laughs> The camera cuts to a mostly black frame, but running through the center of the shot is the opening of a crevasse that the camera sits inside. A dimly lit, badly damaged mine shaft is seen above, and we see a figure taking a step over the crack. As they finish their step, we cut up to uh, the mine shaft, where this group of five people, one dog, and an automaton march their ways through this mine shaft. Opened cracks and fissures would give those of you that have spent any time in mines a huge amount of wary. Uh, these aren't perfectly carved tunnels headed into these hills. Uh, many sections have been cracked open. And that type of cave that's not clean, you know what I mean? Like you have these cracks in the wall that are two feet tall and narrowed down to, you know, half a foot on the far side, but go on a hundred feet in to the rock. Cracks can be seen everywhere and some of the wooden support beams above you have uh, buckled with the weight. Uh, you are pushing through rubble and stepping over fallen equipment and carts as you make your way through uh, this mine owned by Wharton. Has anyone spent any time in mines? Has anyone been a miner in their lives? Not a miner, but I think that John has definitely had to investigate mines and look for creatures that are, you know, living in mines. Cool. I'd like everyone to make a notice roll. Uh, and this is for smell, if it matters. Uh, and I think we're going to do this at a negative one. Thirteen. Nope. Seven. Five. I think I'm going to roll for you, Isaac, tonight, since you don't have dice. Notice I have a D6. You fail. Anyone that succeeded, anyone that got a four and up, notices, well, everyone can smell some sort of foul-smelling thing, but those of you that succeeded, uh, you almost identified as some sort of sewage. Those of you that succeeded with a raise, Alex, I believe, Grant, um, I think this makes sense with your experience. It does smell like sewage, but it, there's like a weird irony odor in it, almost like the musk of an animal or something, or pheromones, you know, um, something that's thick and pungent in the air. You smell that, Doc? Oh, I do. It's rank down here. That, that, uh, that's Foul. unmistakable. Oh, it is? Yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely some animals down here, Doc. And judging by how, uh, how severe this smell is, I think they've got to be pretty big. Doc gets a little startled and trips over some of the, the fallen equipment here. Oh, 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 oh. Are you serious? Do you, think, do you think we should have brought more? No, I think this is perfect, Doc. I think we'll be fine. How is this tunnel lit? The tortoise maybe yeah, that has little, a Yeah, that little gecko. I brought him along. He's got he light. lights up. It's like, you know, a, a blinking 15 feet or something like that. I've inches. definitely got some fucking lantern too, dude. I don't want yeah. <laughs> to <I don't laughs> no. rely on this. No right, offense. Put the lantern on the back of the turtle. We'll be good. Yeah, no we'll one has to hold the gecko. It. I thought it was a gecko. Yeah, was it the turtle or the He's gecko? He's got both. We see this shot of you smelling the air, Grant, the lantern light reflecting in the bullets in your hat's brim, and you hear your dog behind you start to growl. What's your dog's name? Uh, my dog's name is Vigmund. As you turn around, you can see him growling in the darkness behind you, and stepping into the lantern light is uh, John. And as he's stepping into the light, it almost looks like he was mumbling to himself, and then kind of as the light illuminates his face, he kind of startles and looks up at you. I don't know what it is about you, John, but Vigmund sure doesn't like you. Dogs normally don't. Well, it's unfortunate. He likes everyone. John just kind of shrugs and... Maybe it's the smell. You got any more of those, Cajun? Any more what? Cigarettes. You reek of them. All right. If you'd like to smoke down here in a ghost rock mine that did just blow up. And he reaches into his pocket and pulls out some cigarettes. Uh, no, 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 no. He's right. That's actually quite dangerous. Sorry, Kane. I do, on the other hand, have some tobacco. And he reaches down and pulls out like a chew can. Kane puts down the flask for a sec. No, I think I want to smoke. He hands you the cigarette. 
and just kind of shrugs, looks over at the doctor and just kind of smiles a little bit. Kane, if you light that cigarette, it's going to be the last one you ever have. <sighs> Listen, save it for... I'd like everyone to make one more notice roll, and this is going to be an opposed roll. Oh, no. Cameron Reed, you're the only one not at a negative two. Ah, oh, negative okay. two. Well, that's a one for me, Caleb. Yeah, I failed for sure. That's a three because of your stupid nonsense. I got a 15. <laughs> Well, then Cameron Reed, you are the only one not surprised. There is a viscous drop that you almost immediately mistake for rain until you realize you're inside that drops on your uh, tip of your brim and you touch it and it's this sticky liquid. You bring it down to your nose and the same sewage irony smell can be uh, perceived. You look up slowly and the lantern light that hits your eyes reflects like the gleam in a deer's eyes at night before the car runs it down. And we're gonna deal initiative. Cameron, you get a jack of hearts and this thing gets a jack of diamonds. Ooh. Ooh, who goes first, Caleb? Uh, initiative is reverse alphabetical order, so you do, Cameron. Nice. You can see a bit further than everybody else, John. The thing that sticks out to you is the haunting vestigial eyes that peer down at you from the roof as this thing is lunging towards you from a crack in the ceiling. You can see some sort of uh, shimmer off a hard, dark thing above you. You can only see the front of it, but it is huge. Large mandibles and almost claw-like appendages come out of this long thing that's like three feet wide. So is it lunging or is it slowly coming down to like try to... It is skittering and twisting around, peeling down towards you like a drop of molasses slowly pouring from the ceiling. He looks up at this thing and he holds like eye contact with it for just half a second. And then he takes a step back and ducks down. And as he does that, he reaches cross draw. So his right hand to his left hip and likewise the other side and draws his two black pistols. In the lantern light, you can see that they have kind of a redwood handle and some type of a brass inlay that sits in the center of the handles. I'm gonna be taking a minus two because I have quick draw, not fast draw, so I can draw one weapon for free, but not the second one. And I'm gonna take shots at this sucker on the roof. So my main hand attack is going to be a miss. On my off hand, I'm going to use double tap. So it's gonna give me a plus one to hit and plus one to damage as he fires that gun twice. Hit uh, with a raise, so I'll be doing 3d6 damage. That's 14 damage, Caleb. Armor piercing one. So it's got a toughness of 11 with armor two. So reduce that to 10, 14. That's 10 over its toughness. Perfect. Uh, Shaken and wounded. Yeah, how do you wound this creature? I think whatever it is, you're sort of sprayed with uh, blood. So I think it's as simple as him pulling those pistols and just firing off three shots like directly into the ceiling. I think the only way he knows that he hit it is the blood dropping down onto his face as he kind of like takes a diving step backwards to get out of this thing's reach. This thing pours out from the crack in the ceiling, moving its multitude of legs across the ceiling and like moving over a support beam as you step back. It comes off the ceiling, its front half pouring towards you, Cameron, as the rest of the group sees this thing come after you. One could describe it as some sort of large uh, centipede. Uh, Many gross looking legs, uh, some of which are covered in hair and this uh, chitinous body poured down. And about every four legs have these sharp looking mandible uh, claws on them. It moves down towards you, also biting with its mandibles near its vestigial eyes. Uh, It's gonna make one attack roll here. Cameron, what's your parry since this is a melee attack? Six. Cool. So it's got to be a six instead of a four. It's going to roll its fighting. It's not affected by lighting currently. And it also gets a bonus for an unarmed defender. Because you have a pistol and not any sort of melee weapon? Right. And that's a plus two, Alex? That's right. Cool. 
it's rolling a D8. Oh, oh my god. It blew no. up a D8 and it blew up its wild die, a D6, which it always rolls, and you take the better. It oh. blew up the 8 again. So this is it I mean, with you the can raise. only get one raise, right? Yeah, right. so one raise for damage. <laughs> so uh, since it got a raise, it's going to deal an extra D6. Cameron, you might die right now. So <laughs> no. it says uh, strength plus a D6. So that's D10 plus D6 plus D6 from the raise. What's your toughness? Seven. Cool. Almost two raises, but that is a uh, shaken and a wound. I'm going to be using a Benny. I'm going to soak that. You're going to soak it. So you're going to make a vigor roll. Every success and raise reduces the wounds by one. If you get a success, you're going to reduce this wound and you won't be shaken. I did get a success. So you soak it. It does bite you, but does it just bite at some of your clothes? What does it get? So I think it ends up grabbing his hat as he kind of like does a almost a cartwheel backwards trying to get away from it. And it just takes his hat off his head and you know, crushes it and then continues to move forward. This thing drops from the ceiling in a uh, snake-like mess and reels up. All of you take a few steps back. The whole thing is about uh, nine feet long in total, and it's all protected with this chitinous uh, plating. Who was furthest ahead? Probably Grant in the dock. Well, Kane should be real close to Grant almost at all times. Okay, I'll take that. Yeah. Okay, well then, I think both of you are ahead of this situation by a few paces, and I'd like both of you to make notice rolls at negative two. Oh, no. Because of the lighting. We do have a lantern. Does that affect anything? It would, but they're not quite close enough. Uh, four. Blew up a six, you aced a six. 11 minus two, so nine. Nine with a raise. You hear three more, perhaps smaller chitinous creatures coming down from inside this mine, Alex. And with that, we're gonna deal initiative. Cameron Day, ace of, no, Cameron Day, queen of hearts. <laughs> I was like, that is not right, Caleb. <laughs> you gotta upgrade. Alex, seven of spades. <laughs> Cameron Reed, eight of clubs. Isaac, nine of clubs. Marshall, seven of clubs. The creature gets a eight of diamonds. And then finally, we're going to deal for the couple noises in the distance, the two things you've heard, Alex, and they got a joker. <laughs> oh, no. uh, so with Whoa. a joker, they can uh, go whenever they would like, and they get a plus two to everything. I think they're going to go first. Grant just says, oh, we've got more company up here. And with that, they break out of the darkness. Your dog howls and growls behind you, sort of stuck with this larger creature between you and it. These two creatures come out of the darkness, Alex. They are about the size of your dog. They're a little bit smaller. Their size is negative one, so you're gonna get a negative one to attack them if that's something you're interested in. But they rush out of the shadows, one of them on the wall, and both of them sort of lunge towards you the whole time, the whole tunnel is filled with this terrible clicking sound that echoes back to the creatures as they come towards you. Now I have first strike. Ah, However, excellent. Yeah. I've just got a lantern right now. So you're going to make I'm going to try and like kick one. You could use the lantern as an improvised weapon, but if you oh, roll that a sounds like a really bad If idea. you roll a critical failure, it would explode, you know, but it would deal an extra d4 damage on top of your strength. I Ooh. think I'll just You said if I roll a failure, a failure, a it'll critical explode? failure. Oh. So you'd have to roll double ones. So I'm just going to whack it with the lantern and it won't explode? The light's going to go out though, isn't it? I think it's fine. All right. I feel like it would break. Those things are just glass. Yeah, they're glass. glass. I'm just going to kick it. Let's just call it a kick. It's just called a kick. Oh, a six blew up. This You're going to kick the shit out of it. I got myself a 10. Uh, Well, even with the negative one, hit with a raise. Excellent. So I am not a martial artist of any kind. (laughs) So just strength. Just strength. But it's at the raise. Do I still add a D6? You add a D6, yeah. That's not bad. I got a D6 strength. Let's see how this goes. You kicked as hard as my gun, dude. Uh, not not at all, actually. I got no. a six. <laughs> you, can, you can re-roll your damage if you want. I won't, though. Uh, you, sh- <laughs> you shake it. You shake it. Okay, that's not bad. So you kick it back in its mandibles. It goes back with a start, but the other one tries to wrap up your leg. It's going to make a bite attack, dude. Fighting is a D6. This one is not a wild card, so it just rolls a D6. You really should have had my rifle out. It misses, but I'm going to spend a Benny. Oof. To re-roll. Oh, it blows oh. up a six into a ten. What's Ooh. your parry? A uh, five. That's so a hit with the raise. Ooh, no. raise. This might be really bad for you just now. Uh, so he's rolling D8, D6, D6. Oh, oh come on. Blew up a six. So we're looking at... Oh. Well, Caleb, oh. are you serious right now, dude? Yep. Yeah, oh, this wait, is a great... Wait. We're at 16 damage. Uh... Okay, we're at 18 damage, Alex. What's your toughness? Five. So you'll be taking three Ooh. wounds right I'm now. I'm going to try and soak as much as I can. Soak. Sorry, buddy. Yeah, no, you're not. 
Well, I soaked one, so I got two wounds already. Oof, okay. Uh, said, nobody has any healing, right? Doc? Doc! I got a thing I could use. It'd be all right. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. Alex, the first thing you need to do is make a vigor roll at negative two. In addition to my wound modifiers? Ooh, yes! Cool. <laughs> <laughs> A fail. Well, this is not a great start for the intrepid explorer Grant. This thing wraps up his leg and in a moment bites into you with these two almost ant-like mandibles. Blood pours from your leg and we get a close-up shot as this thing injects you with venom. We follow this like liquid into your veins and then we get a shot of your eyes sort of rolling back in your head as we see Grant seize up and fall paralyzed to the ground. I'm paralyzed? Hey, you yes. okay, Grant? <laughs> What's Ooh. going on, dude? Grant? <laughs> okay. Grant? He's taking off his right. headphones. He's, He's leaving. His paper. Hey, see you, dude. He's leaving. Hey, this is Savage Worlds. This is Deadlands. You could die at any time, dude. Uh, you are going to be paralyzed for two minutes. You're going to be paralyzed. So that's like, uh, what, 12 rounds? Out, you're out of this combat. Yeah, yeah. we're not really combat. in this combat. And we'll get to the other thing later. With that, these things charge in. Uh, you guys see Grant go down. Cameron, Day, Kane, it's your turn. So Kane starts. You see a, a well-built left hand as it reaches across his body. And then it flashes up to his eyes behind his spectacles. And you see those dead eyes finally come to life as he pulls out his long Bowie knife. And he jumps into the fray. He's going to go straight for the one that's wrapped around and currently paralyzing the shit out of Grant. So it's the size of a, uh, a small dog here, which means you get a negative one when you're attacking it. Should I still get that even though he's biting the shit out of him right now? Uh, yeah, and in addition, if you roll snake eyes, you're going to stab out. Yeah, that's, that, that's <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm all right with that. You mean win. I'll take that <laughs> as long as I get this, the stupid centipede. No. You want to Benny that? It's definitely going to be a miss. Benny, much better. So five. That is exactly a hit. Oh, lovely. Nice. That is good news. Does this knife have armor piercing? Uh, Yeah, one. Okay, sweet. So strength plus a D4 plus one. Oh. <laughs> that is two ones. So okay. That's two damage. Uh, three. Your knife glances harmlessly off this uh, chitinous body. You didn't angle it right. It scrapes off with a horrible sound as uh, it's still just holding on to the person that's brought you into these mines. Isaac, it's your turn. Day. Dolores, with a really smooth, practiced motion, whips out the uh, the peacemaker that's hidden under her coat, like under her left armpit. Let's shoot this thing. Well, I have a quick draw holster and a D8 in shooting. The lantern light is lighting it up that sort of uh, just sat in Grant's hand. Five to hit. 2d6 plus 1 AP1. Oh, Oof. two ones. You want to Benny that? <laughs> no, no, no Benny. I'll just let that bullet kind of glance off. The big one goes. It's still locked on to you, John. I think you've barely noticed these two new assailants because this thing is so much larger than the other two uh, tunnel critters deeper in here. It's going to attack you with a mandible and hopefully not wipe the party. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seven against your parry. Oh my god, it blew up a d10. <laughs> oh, uh, what is 21 yeah, yeah, damage? Nice, my toughness, toughness is 21. seven. My toughness is seven. Four, eight, hey, 12. welcome to the club, dude. <laughs> That's three raises, Cameron. You gonna soak this? I'm gonna use a Benny, Caleb. Okay, great. Yikes. Well, well Doc, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> blow this whole uh, fucking down. <laughs> That's a 10, you son of a bitch. You soak two, so you're shaken and wounded, yeah? So I take a wound. We see this shot of it coming at you with its... Same mandibles again. Same mandibles. It's mandibles yes. that bite into your stomach, and we see the same shot we saw on Grant. But with him, where we saw red pumping blood as this thing injected him with poison, we see the same shot just barely go into your veins, but nothing's moving in there. Uh, you were unaffected by this thing's poison. Uh, we're going to move on. So this thing is it's engaged with me, unfortunately, which means I'm going to be using its parry. Caleb, what is this thing's parry? A six. Well, don't you need to become unshaken? I do need to become unshaken, so I'm going <laughs> to... Which I do that. So now I will be shooting this thing. It's a six, Caleb. 
10 damage. It is shaken. So I think he takes his left gun and he just puts it down onto its head as it is biting into him and he pulls the trigger. And unfortunately, I think the bullet kind of just catches at the wrong angle and shoots off, but it makes it let go of him. And he's gonna raise up his right gun and I'm going to use my, uh, my second attack. And I'm gonna be using double tap on this one. A hit, no raise. Nine. Not enough. Uh, I'm gonna use a Benny to reroll damage. Cool. These things are gonna kill the party if we don't <laughs> kill them now. Uh, nope. Damn. Many shots are fired off in these echoing chambers as we move on to Alex. Now, you're incapacitated, however. I've got my dog. It's gonna see its best friend being attacked by this tor terrible little insect. nightmare bug. Yeah, nightmare insect. And it's gonna go in there and try and bite it, dude. Uh, cool. I'm gonna make a fighting roll. It's a D8. Uh, cool. That's six blew up to a four. That's ten. He bite Minus him. one for the size. Yeah. So probably not a raise, huh? I'm also in berserk, so I'm gonna stab your dog. Parry is five. That's still a raise. Strength plus D6. His strength is a D8. Oh, come on, dog. Come on. So we're looking at 10 damage. So we get this shot of this tunnel critter's belly, and it's sort of in that thing where animals do when they're about to throw up, you know, like there's a sound in its throat and you can see something moving forward. And then we see the dog lunge at it and pull this thing off you. How does your dog kill this creature? Oh, what a Alex? good boy. Ooh, good what dog. a very good boy. That doggo's getting a treat. Uh, honestly, saving you from an egg insertion, Alex. Well, here's Whoa. the thing. I don't think this dog's ever fought a giant insect before. They have no instincts built into their, you know, into their... The only instinct it has right now is the instinct of love. There's no instinct oh. built into its dog bones dog to bones. fight these giant bugs. So I think it just gets really lucky and it just bites the head. It sees that maybe that's where the threat's coming from and it just bites into it, gnaws on it, and it's powerful jaws. Just snap down on this thing. Oh, the crack oh, reverberates. The crack. It definitely does the thing that dogs do with snakes where it just shakes its head violently yeah. and yeah, just like tears it, it into mm. chunks. He, he launches it off yeah. into the cave. It's like the sound of a crab shell being cracked. And then this uh, viscous liquid pours out with the irony sewage smell. Uh, we cut from that creature slamming into the wall to the doc's eyes reacting to that and then back to the lantern lit hallway. I think there's the, the light of the lantern reflecting in uh, his dark hazel green eyes as he's looked in shock at this ridiculous melee going on here with these creatures. Ridiculous for sure, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. The little guy stumbles and claws over to his turtle. <laughs> oh, all right, uh, this should work, I swear. <laughs> and, and he's going to start fidgeting with the uh, controls. The head of the turtle is going to pop forward, and he's going to start entering in some dials, and he's going to try to cast protection or uh, deflection on the uh, good old paralyzed buddy of his and Kane that he oh, sees getting mod. He took some good cracks. Did you like oh, I got, actually take damage? Yeah, I took a wound, dude. Yeah, he's getting hurt. So Don't you're wait, you're just doing deflection? That's what I had. Oh. <laughs> so you're going to be making a mad science roll here. I think it's actually going to be at a, at a multi-action uh, penalty because I need to talk to you, sir. Okay, so negative two. Yeah, what do you want to do? So Doc Soren Erickson has great luck, which means that at the beginning of the game, I drew an extra two bennies. Everyone got three, you got five. That's right. I got that because luck is a prerequisite for uh, the scavenger edge, which allows me once per session to find a uh, much needed piece of equipment. Okay. And he's going <laughs> just caving equipment laying around. No, maybe. he's been Some carrying his stuff. pack with him. He's got all his tools with him cuz he's got to be able to <laughs> investigate the ghost rock and any of the other findings we might get down here. And in his pouch he has stuffed uh, a prototype healing injector that uh, he produces from his pocket after Now, he when you say prototype... It. I mean, I'd like <laughs> to say that it uh, you know, has an extra couple powers to it. Uh, hopefully being able to potentially cure him of his disease in addition to hopefully resuscitating him. If you'd be cool with a greater healing spell, that's what I'd be looking for. I mean, you spent a whole edge on it. You I can did. do this once Two per... edges, once per session. Here's what I would say. This is a one-time use thing for the whole session. If you get a success, you're going to heal his wounds. If you get a raise, you can heal his paralysis. Good thing you got those binnies. So yeah. wait, are we agreeing that it's a one time, like this is it or? Yeah, will I be able to use is this it something maybe a couple carry? more times? We'll see. 
<laughs> I hope so because we're good. this isn't this is the first combat. Yeah, I think, uh, I think Ooh, he's got a, a few deal, of dude. those in there probably. Okay. Yeah. I'm so, sure all these dice. So I'll uh, be rolling with a d10. So wait, what, what, what does this look like? You just talking to a turtle? Right. Uh, he's sort of mumbling to himself. Let's roll first. Fray. So it's deflection first. Minus two. That's a six. Cool. Nice job. And then this will be for the uh, the healing as he sort of clambers over some of the fallen rock. If you roll snake eyes right now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave. And he's gonna try to inject this into his friend. Jesus Christ! Oof. I'm gonna go ahead Benny. and spend Benny. So you're gonna heal his wounds, but not the paralysis, which lasts for two minutes. No, he's got negative two. It's multi-action. Oh, yeah. so it's still can a I failure. Can Benny that again? You can Benny it again. Yeah. Oh, no, no dude, serious? Down you're three crazy, bangs. man. This is dude, first combat. Hey, there we go. Now it's a four. Your wounds are healed, but not your paralysis. Thank you, Doc. Hey, you're not All dead. right. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> so, from the bottom of my heart. So as Doc clambers away from his turtle having uh, successfully activated its uh, deflection powers. He uh, stumbles over to the fallen Grant, and he fumbles into his pouch and pulls out, looks like maybe a, a rebreather of sorts, probably some sort of concoction of ghost rock and who knows what else he's found. And uh, he jams it onto your face and squeezes the bladder of it, and you uh, have a regenerative force sort of thrust into you for a moment there. That's excellent. But he doesn't move. That's fine. You know. <sighs> it didn't work. Oh, no. We need to get out of here. Hurry. And with that, let's deal a new round of initiative. Doc, you're up first. So uh, there, <laughs> this, this smell so permeates the whole room. Their clicking chitinous sounds are echoing here. One of your companions is holding a lantern behind you, and uh, your good friend Grant is sort of uh, seizing on the ground, his lantern nearby. <laughs> uh, his dog has taken care of one of the small creatures, but the other one is still accosting him, and the large creature is still moving after John. Thinking quickly as he does his best with Grant, uh, he'll look around and, and see that things are not looking so great uh and so he's going to jog back over to his turtle he's got one more ability he thinks he's gonna make work how many uh power points you got left there that's what i was double checking on <laughs> <laughs> also what does your deflection look like turtle shield turtle yeah there, shield? there's definitely like a, a a hemisphere of almost looking like flaming turtle hexagonal shells that uh, float above you and sort of like press into your bodies uh i'll go ahead and cast slow on the two of these chitinous creatures. The weird science roll as he goes back and flips like a tumbler that has a new set of dials and knobs and he enters those in and he is able to cast slow. He's gonna spend an extra point to slow down the second one and that'll last for five rounds. What does that do to them? It has the movement speed each round. They don't have anything to roll this round but they have to make a spirit roll to shake the effects. Alex, Grant is still unconscious, but of course your Irish wolfhound is not. You said there was another one of these things nearby? Yeah, right near you and Oh, the right dog. near me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, I think that even though I haven't given Vigmund any commands since I'm unconscious and all, you know? Yeah. I think that just instinctually he would want to protect me, so he'd probably go for it if it's close. Cool. So I'm going to do another fighting attack against it. It lunges at it, pushing its front paws, uh, like crunching this thing down into the ground. That's an easy hit with the raise, nice. two aces. Got the hit with the raise. Uh, 11 damage there. There is a sick crunching sound as it crunches through the exoskeleton, uh, this viscous goop pouring out over your wolf's angry teeth. Uh, with that, we move on to the large creature, the yeah. only one left. Oh, it's also shaken. I keep forgetting. I'm so sorry. It's going to make a roll to become unshaken at the beginning of its turn. It's fine. I think it notices that its poison does not affect you, Cameron. It changes its vestigial eyes from looking at you to turning towards Dolores. It lunges forward with uh, poison-filled mandibles and makes an attack. Um, oh. Plus a six, seven, eight, nine. With its wound penalty that's still hit with the raise. Oof, so sorry. What's your toughness, Isaac? Six. Okay, that's only one raise, so shake and wound unless you want to soak. Yeah, I'll, I'll spend a Benny just to free soak, right? Uh, yep, no, no. so make a vigor roll. That's going to be a, a D8. 
a success. So you soak this. Uh, what does it look like when you soak this? It's a big swing at her, and as she's ducking away, the thing that keeps her safe is that big book bag that she has with her books in it and stuff. Kind of swings up and catches the uh, blow and just kind of knocks her to the side into the wall of the uh, establishment. Moving on, Cameron. I'm going to shoot. So this is my main hand. I'm going to use double tap. It's a miss. Offhand miss so yeah so he's just firing off a bunch of bullets not doing anything it's hard to hit these these slippery yeah, little buggers he's freaking almost out of ammo <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey man at least you're not unconscious on the ground <laughs> yeah kane it's your turn kane is not worried about missing against this thing so he's gonna go in full rush and he's gonna do a wild attack against oh, this yeah. giant oh. monster so you get a plus two but you're vulnerable now absolutely okay hit with the race Ooh, wow, well, that's a 16, dead. 17 damage. Oof. Almost two raises. It's still alive? Shaken with a raise. Oh my goodness. They're going to soak, man. It's going to make a bigger roll. Uh, you stab into this thing with little effect as it gets a sick six. Another glancing blow off its chitinous high. A six, hide. six. Well, six, since it's so six. big, can it just be that my knife sunk? deep into its body, but it doesn't seem to be reacting. That's lovely. Yes. All right, Doc, what'll it be? Yeah, Doc. Give me your turn. I put 14 power points into my turtle to cast those spells, and I have six for my personal pool. I'm going to use three of those and the edge gadgeteer. This entire action is going to be me building some sort of, uh, it's going to be basically a wand of magic missiles. I'm going to try to build. build something mid-fight? Yeah. Gadgeteer. Okay. It, takes a, whole, it takes a whole well. action and three power Super points. Super well. I have nothing but faith. Wow. Okay, cool. And you're going to build a magic missile wand? <laughs> I can spend three power points to jury rig a device yeah, from a duh, reasonable dude. collection of spare parts, okay. which are in my pocket. Right, yeah, I'll right. be able to use any normal power available to weird scientists of my rank or lower. Cool. Take a uh, weird science roll at minus two, and this will be my whole turn. I'm you know, going to re-roll that. Cool. Oof. We are throwing minis away, dude. This is fight number one. Hey, blowing up a six. That is a nine, sir. With a raise. Does it do anything with a raise? Uh, it doesn't say anything specific. Here's what I'm going to let you do. If you want to use it this round, you can do it at a negative two. All right, well, then I'm going to make a weird science roll at a minus two. Yeah, I use bolt to blast the bug. So far, that's a six that blew up. Whew. It's a seven. Damn. Which makes it a five. Hit, no raise. Alex, you're the, the bolt master. That's 2d6 normally, right? Yeah. Uh, it's still it's 10, 10 points. So it's shaken. A 10, it is not even shaken. But uh, he is going to use his movement to stumble back down the uh, the tunnel away from this thing. Cool. It is the agent's turn. John's getting pissed off. I think at this point, you can see he's like raising his guns again, and he like stops for a second and leans over his shoulder and just says, I'm trying. And then he takes another shot at this thing. These are his last bullets. That's a miss with his other gun. <laughs> And uh, he's out of bullets. The gun smoke and reverberating fire light up the mine shaft. It's the creature's turn. I have a knife in it, Caleb. Ooh, you're right. It twists back. This poison dripping from its mouth trips on its chitinous hide as it comes at you with its mandibles, Cameron. And I think it's going to do a multi-action. It's going to attack you once, and then it's going to attack Cameron Reed once as well. So this is a negative one against a seven. A miss. I'm going to spend one of its two remaining bennies. Do it. Miss. Wow. Okay. And then against you, Cameron Reed. Oh, my oh God. My it blew God. up both. So that's definitely hit with a raise. Bring it. Bring that's, it on. Oh, that's not a bring it, dude. Bring it on. Hey, not that have, bad. You do have two points of armor. Uh, So seven. I'm shaken. Nice. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. So not that bad. It lunges out with its mandibles. I think you pull out your knife uh, from it, Kane, as you're sort of like pushed back, kind of dodging out of its mandibles. Some of the claws on its legs come after you, Cameron, as you like push him away. And then uh, we cut to the dog. Only one target left. Oh boy, I don't know what the dog would do in this situation. How far away is it? In game terms, about three inches, so I think that's nine yards. Uh, maybe it just like barks and tries to do like an intimidation roll. Ah, uh, you could make it yeah, vulnerable. Maybe. I think that would make more sense. I think it would uh, not want to leave my unconscious body on the ground, so it's probably standing over me. And then it, yeah, I think it's going to try and growl and bark at this thing. Then this is a test of wills. Either use your intimidation or taunt opposed by its spirit. Can I argue that this dog has a plus two? Because it's the only thing that's killed any of these bugs. It's, it's been pretty it's vicious. It's probably covered in blood. I'll give you a plus one. I'll buy it. 
We'll take it. Plus one, seven. Seven. What happened? Oh, but this negative one. So it's a six because of its wound. So uh, this thing is now vulnerable. So yep. it's going to get a negative. Everyone's going to get a plus two to attack it. Lovely. Cool. This dog is MVP. <laughs> <laughs> All these PCs come in here and this <laughs> stupid dog just <laughs> rolls into the show. Dolores, the sound in here is deafening. The racking fire of hammers and gunfire, the sound of it clicking out, uh, trying to get a lay of the room, and the dog barking can be heard. What do you want to do? She is uh, a little perturbed, I think, by by all this. So as, as she glances around in this sheer like room of absolute chaos, she's going to pull out a very freshly issued shiny Gatling pistol. Dropping that peacemaker, whips this out of her other holster, and is going to fire a Gatling pistol at this thing. So this thing is a rate of fire 2, so that's 2d8 and then a d6 wild die. Uh, the wild die blows up into a 7, so you hit with a 9 and you hit with an 8. So both of those are hit with raises. Uh, what's the damage of a Gatling pistol? A Gatling pistol is a 2d6 plus 1. Beautiful. So both of these are 3d6 plus 1. 12 damage on the first hit. That shakes it. Uh, second attack does the same damage. A wound to it, so it's taken two wounds and it's shaken. What does this look like? What does this sound like? It's her whipping out this new pistol. She's very pleased with it, and it's just as it spins up, you hear that of the ghost rock, and then just pop, 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 pop. She starts to, to fire off shots into this thing. The piece that perhaps uh, throws everyone off just a little bit is she's shot guns like this before. This is not her uh, her first rodeo. I just hope her skill is more evident now. With that, Kane, it's your turn. Kane and Cameron are also kind of getting tired of the length of this fight. So <laughs> yeah. he's going to go full wild attack mode, and he's going to flip his knife from stabbing to lunging spot. So he's going to flip that knife around, he's going to jump at this thing and finish it off ASAP. Are you going to make, like, maybe two attacks instead of one attack? Can I fucking do that? Yeah, yeah well, you're going to be at minus. Okay, what, what so edges be, do you have? You don't have to have any Nothing. edges, and it'll right. be at plus two total. Lovely, I can do that. First one is a badness. Seven. Hit, no race. That's eight so far. Just need two. Yes. Thank you, God. It has taken a third wound. Three wounds on this creature as we go into potentially the last round of combat. So I'm going to spend its last penny to redraw its action card. Ooh. Jack of oh, Diamonds. Nice. It's going to go first in this last round. Kill uh, somebody, Caleb. It's going to go after you, buddy. Get him. I don't have any more bennies to soak. Well, you may be dying in this attack, a D8. It's going to go a wild attack. It doesn't care at this point. It's trying desperately to lash out. Oh, it misses. Oh, my God. No one yes. may die today with We're that. We're whittling him down. Kane, it's your turn. He's vulnerable. Uh, Kane's already attached to this thing's back as he stabbing furiously and he's going to shockingly continue stabbing furiously six that is a hit man. oh my Lovely. god okay all you have to do is 10 damage okay so this is plus three how do you kill it Kane has been on this guy's back and he's been stabbing. Blood's been gushing all over him. He uses his right hands to grab one of his mandibles as he stretches the creature's mouth open and then shuts the knife directly into its maw. There is a chittering death rattle as this thing's lifeless body touches the mine floor. Uh, it barely hangs over that crevasse we saw at the beginning of the scene, like the front uh, half of its eyes and its mandibles hanging down to this darkness below. It takes a few seconds before the bloodlust exits Kane's eyes. We cut to a shot of Grant's eyes as you take a breath in. I think can... Vigman's licking my face. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. You can feel his paralysis sort of wearing off after two minutes has passed. You groggily bring yourself up to your feet, and you can see your colleagues have uh, surrounded the large dead body of this creature. There's a, a moment of silence as they all just kind of like take in the moment and take in everything that just happened. John squats down, reaches into his satchel, and pulls out a big leather-bound book. It looks old. Some of the pages are torn out. It looks like it has a bunch of extra pieces of paper shoved into it. There's a lot of handwriting. There's coffee stains, whiskey stains. Uh, some of the pages look like they've been burned. He just kind of flips it open and is kind of filing through this book. 
Caleb, I would like to make a research check, or I suppose an occult roll. Research makes sense. To see uh, what I can gleam about this thing, or if I know anything about it. Would you like to do something similar, Dolores? Yes. That's a four. What do I got in the agent's book? Yeah, you don't have a, uh, a ranger's Bible, but you definitely have a lot of handwritten notes and sort of, like you said, a, a book, a collection of files. Um, I think these sort of things have popped up before. The first agent that uh, encountered them coined them as tunnel critters, large uh, centipede or millipede type creature. They seem to pop up in areas like this, abandoned mines and also cave-like structures. Everybody still have their fingers and toes? More or All less. Of them? Yeah, it looks like everyone's okay. Sure gets the bud going, doesn't it? <laughs> Where are these things? Dolores kind of shoves gently, uh, shoulders her way up to stand next to him, and peers down at it while she reloads. What do you think it is? Does not seem like they have a name for it, but I know it as a tunnel critter. (laughs) He kind of laughs to himself a little bit. They are quite dangerous, and as we have seen here, have a paralyzing venom. You don't say. Is that what happened to you? Oh, I should take a closer look at this. That, That might be useful. Be my guest. A few feet away from the group, Kane, you're sort of peering off into these various uh, cracks and tunnels that lead off from where you are. And you can hear the distant clicking, chittering sound. Not coming closer, but somewhere in the distance, the sound that would um, indicate more of these creatures are hiding. Kane now lights that cigarette that he's been holding on and begins to take a drag off of it. Well, this light's not going to set the whole tunnel off if those pistols of yours ain't. Now that is a hell of a point. And John lights up a cigarette himself. We're not so safe here. We might want to mm, scoot on. Hey, Kane, you mind carrying this lantern? Mm, yeah. He has this uh, kind of explorer's backpack on, all these different pockets and stuff. And on the side of it, there's a rifle boot. He slides out a, um, a Winchester 73 from there. Rather ornate looking. Nice walnut stock. You can see some carvings in there if you look really carefully. But he's also fashioned it uh, with some metal kind of studs and wire through the top of it. I would like someone to make a survival roll to navigate these tunnels. Uh oh. Well, we got the map. Do we have any sort of bonuses? Uh, Great. Okay. Yeah, I'll give you. I'll give you a plus one. It would be a plus two, but the explosion has changed the landscape and the layout of this place. Gotcha. Plus one. I got a four. I don't want to speak for your character, Alex, but I think Grant. I mean, this sort of backs up his hypothesis that this is just sort of like a natural creature that has been excluded from the normal ecosystem by location. Yeah, Grant's not like super savvy when it comes to uh, knowledge of the natural world, you know, evolution and taxonomy, that kind of thing. But he's seen the fossils. So in his mind, that definitely clicks, I think. So he might already be smart enough to be like, oh, the oxygen down there must be, might be richer, and maybe they've grown to the, a larger size. But he, in his mind, he's like, well, I've seen some of these in, uh, you know, maybe Washington or something, and I've seen some here. There might be some dinosaurs down there. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so you pick up the lantern and uh, move forward, uh, kind of pushing through this uh, grogginess you felt from the latent paralysis. We get a shot that uh, the group walking past a hole in the wall that spills out into this massive cavern that even with your light and with your eyes, Cameron Reed, can't see the opposite side of. I think there's a low whistle let out from Kane that echoes into this massive chamber as you walk by. Uh, The edges are sharp and jagged. And I think it might be clear to Dr. Soren that this might be the remnants of the explosion that detonated in here, Hmm. sort of cracking and leveling out this place. With your four, Alex, you either can keep moving through uh, the mine tunnels that these people have created, or if you care to stop him, Dr. Soren, you can sort of take a shortcut and uh, rappel down this massive sinkhole. Oh, well... You know, Dr. Zorn isn't quite as spy as he used to be, and, <laughs> you know, while that uh, that encounter before was pretty entertaining, maybe be safer if we don't go that way. So I think... Um, <laughs> I like how you did all of that <laughs> yeah. in character. Is he just, like, talking mm-hmm. to himself in the, yeah. in the corner? Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, Dr. Zorn's going to take a look at this. Um... I don't know. Can I make a notice roll to see how dangerous it looks of a shortcut? Like, sure. how deep is this crevasse that we'd yeah. be looking to propel down into? The uh, the eight blew up, and that makes my notice roll on 11. 
Well, with the race, I think you drop some flicker of light down there. Toss the gecko. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah toss the gecko. You can climb back. It's not that far of a drop. It's about 40 feet down to the bottom. And as you drop it, you hear that sound reverberate in this empty sort of sinkhole-like chamber. But you don't hear any of the chitness clicking. So it seems like it would be safe to go down there with merely a flat athletics roll from all parties. No, how would I, nope. um, no? I have a D4 and I don't have any bennies. I'm old and I also have a D4 minus two. I can't figure out a good way to get a 180 pound dog down this. <laughs> <laughs> and a presumably very heavy turtle. That turtle is The turtles are steel. anchor. It's definitely staying up there and then I don't have, uh, you don't have it's like 800 pounds, pounds 900 have, pounds we could like wait an hour and then i've got points for some stuff but uh yeah we'd be leaving it up there for sure long way around caleb please sorry caleb we're fighting more centipedes <laughs> yeah it may be the case yeah it may be the case what i like is a stealth roll from everybody and i've got some ideas on the other end okay all right anybody fail uh doc erickson failed with a one here's what we're gonna do soren okay we're gonna draw a card if we draw clubs we're gonna have another fucking encounter <laughs> If we don't draw clubs, you'll be fine. Pick a card. How about if he draws clubs, he just takes an automatic wound? That's lovely. That's pretty good. Yeah. Well, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this, but I am clumsy. I could totally... Come on, come on you handsome son of a bitch. That's Ace a... of diamonds. Yeah, boy. Wow. Thank God. How do you narrowly avoid a group of uh, tunnel critters? So I think we've been sort of crouching along. These things clearly can uh, attach themselves to the ceiling. And have echolocation. We've been crawling through these caves for a while, trying our best to be quiet, and we hear the chitinous clatter echo down the hallway again. Everybody sort of freezes for a moment, and good old Doc, he tries. He stays really still, but he's on a wobbly rock, and he slips and bumps into the uh, the turtle and he hears that it's rumbling and so he puts it into a quick shutdown mode to make sure that it's quiet as we see one of these large centipede creatures skitter across and stop for a moment and it stalks sort of twist and turn Ooh, but you're lucky right so that rock that you slipped on is falling down a hill somewhere else uh huh yeah and so it keeps clattering on down the incline that we've got and we see the the little centipede head snap and then chase after it you can get a Benny for that description, Marshall. Hey, yeah, well done, Marshall. Wow. I love you, man. You're my favorite out of all of us. You're my favorite. <laughs> this, doc, this doctor's pretty lucky. That was nice. You enter a large chamber, Grant leading the way. The roof has sort of caved in, and you can see now that this is the bottom of that sinkhole uh, that you could have climbed down. There is a large... Uh, rock chamber that all of the edges have been scorched the thing smells like ozone and every rock face is burnt and in addition to the light of the lantern you bring into the room it is also lit by flickering fires seeming to come from cracks in the bottom of this cavern uh, loose rock and stilt makes your uh, travel across this room as you're exploring it quite treacherous. And many, many cracks and crevices that run down farther than you can see litter the floor of the room. Uh, many of them sprouting with jets of fire at intermittent points in time. Watch your step, everyone. Well, what do you make of that, Ranger? As he looks at Dolores. John kind of smiles when Kane says that. Ranger. Yeah. You don't get a Gatling pistol like that just from anywhere. On the contrary, sir, a Gatling pistol is, uh, uh, uh... Very expensive and hard to come by. No, they're neither. No, fucking hell they're not. Have you never seen a weapon like this before? I find that extremely hard to believe. Mm. She's, like, tucking it under her coat. Never seen a cavern like this either. Speaking of which, um... Ranger or not, perhaps we should put a pin in this conversation. Continue our trek here. It's your money, Grant. That is fine by me. It's a shame about all this ghost rock, though. And he kind of glances around. This was probably one hell of a vein that went up. It's funny you say that, Cameron. God damn it, Caleb. Middle of the room, directly under the sinkhole, there is like a large amount of debris and powderized rock that's covering it. But there is like almost a crater in the center of this room uh, lit up by firelight coming from the rocks themselves. And sort of centered in the middle of this crater, 
is the biggest piece of black gold any of you have seen in your lives. It's a piece of ghost rock that's, it's about 150 pounds. Ghost rock goes for like 12 or $16 an ounce. So even just a fifth of this large thing you're looking at uh, could pay your yearly salary, any one of you, for the next 50 years. Is that something like an average person would know? Definitely. It has been a large boom in the weird west, much like the gold rush was, but only more so, because instead of just being a valuable shiny object, it's also the force of innovation driving the modern industry of the new sciences and the infernal devices that uh, lead that charge. Well, look at that. Eureka. Oh, magnificent. This is amazing. Dolores, gentlemen, you, you realize what we found here? I do. This is... this is something else. This is a fuck ton of money is what it is. Looks like a couple hundred pounds of trouble to me. Hey, we didn't come in here to steal ghost rock, okay? We came in here to find out what these reports actually are to investigate. Well, I came for money. You'll get your paycheck. If anyone would like to approach this thing, it would be like a simple flat roll to make your way across these cracks and crevices. I would argue athletics, but if you want to argue anything else, you're free to. Listen, Kane, if you stick around, we'll wheel that thing out of here on our way out. I'll give you my share. Promise. In addition to what I promised you earlier. Now that's an offer I can get behind. Well, that's settled then. We'll go. We'll search out this uh, chamber and we'll come back. Are we just going to leave it here? Well, no one knows we're down here, and no one knows it's down here. I definitely do not want to try to carry that thing out. Worse that happens, it ignites and we're all dead anyways. That ghost rock is powder, and that is when it tends to ignite. And with the unstable footing, I would suggest that none of us attempt it without proper tools. But, he kind of shrugs, I ain't in charge. Well, there's got to be some mining carts or something. Remnants oh, of... sure, yeah. If we could find all of a cart, I could repair it. We could get it all out of here easy. I just need a little time. I'm just concerned. I mean, look at the ground of this room. All of the rock is dark, almost like it's covered with soot. And you look around for any source of ignition, and you're not a smart man, Grant. <laughs> at least... <laughs> kind of smart man. Not, not in the... Uh, average. You're not an average. academic man. <laughs> True. It appears that the rocks themselves are on fire. Dolores looks around kind of in wonder at this and goes, My father warned me about the fires of Beelzebub, but I never dreamed they would be so large. And she uh, starts to kind of wander off to the side, lost in rapture in this place. Careful, Miss Day. You get too close to that fire and stir up some of that ghost rock. You're going to be going up in flames as well. What do you say we just move this thing into a safer spot, leave it there, continue What safer spot do you propose than in the midst of a cavern infested with wild beasts? One that's not on fire? You do have a point there. Can I have like a a picture of, in just size comparison, how big this rock is? It's like the size of a large beer keg. Okay, so then it could totally fit on my turtle automaton. Yes. If you want to make a roll to get over there, well, and then Kane's you want... already well, that making would slow a roll us down like crazy. You're, wouldn't you're it? making it over there, absolutely. Then Probably let's not. see it. Five. You nimbly jump over these cracks in the earth. We get a shot from down below as you kick off some of the black rock, and it clacks on each side, echoing down into the chamber below. Athletics roll. Yep. You're coming too. Of course, of course, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna use a penny. <laughs> 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 Two threes. Gonna re-roll those. All right, that's six blew up. Nice, nice. No problem, 11. Okay, with a raise even. Uh, You make it over there before Kane. I just jump past him. Sort of bounding over. Kane's taking his time, and you're jumping from sort of between crack and crack, and then Grant just runs, just jumping over the cracks like they're not even there. John takes a seat on the other (laughs) side. Sits down and starts mumbling to himself. Now the tricky part's gonna be getting this out of here, Kane. Once you're over here and Kane's not quite caught up to you, your head pivots back to say that to him, and then it pivots towards this large nugget of ghost rock. And I'd like you to make a notice roll, Alex. You're gonna get something even if you fail, but each success and raise will get you a little more information. Blowing up a six. 
You got a nine. There are bits of metal sticking out from the inside of this ghost rock nugget. Well, that's interesting. You lean closer in and with your rays, it's like a copper turned green with time and age. One of the oldest metals used in ancient civilizations. And in addition to that, with your rays, Alex, you can hardly believe it, buddy. There appears to be ancient writing engraved on the metal. And with a raise, it almost looks like badly engraved Aztec, or perhaps a dialect older than any currently known. Ghost rock formed on the outside of this thing. It wasn't put in, right? That would take millions of years, if not billions. And there is a thing inside this rock that has writing on it. This could potentially be the oldest Mesoamerican artifact ever discovered. Not only that, as you're looking through it, your heart starts to raise. This could prove that civilization, metalworking, and written language existed millennia before modern scholars currently believe. It could rewrite our fundamental understanding of humanity. My God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> His eyes just fucking light up. And then Kate jumps in behind you. Hey, uh, Dolores. Yes. Remember what I said about anthropology? Yes. I was wrong. We're gonna bring this thing to you. I want you to take a look at it. All right. Yeah, all right. Wait till you see this. A scarred hand with a wedding ring places its heavy palm on top of the rock before you lift it up. Now remember, Grant. You gave me your part of this, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think we could probably get a handsome reward from the society, and I will give you every penny they give me as my share. His eyes meet yours. All right. I think this would be a strength roll from both of you at negative one. Okay. And if either of you fails, it's we going can't. down a crack. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. <sighs> Unless you want to take further precautions, yeah. How strong are you, man? A D6. Well, I mean, I got, I got Benny. two bennies. Is this the only path forward in this cavern? So the thing is, from here, there's no mine shafts further down. It's only cracks in the earth. So it could be, I mean, to you, Alex, I mean, these are things that could be split open and opening up new ecologies down here, you know? Our whole thing about picking this up is to get it away from all the fire. Right, right yeah. And if we fail, then it goes right into the fire. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to pick this up. All right. If I see you going for it, I'm definitely going to jump in and try and help. Plus okay. Plus a six. Okay. Great news. Now, he's got a raise. Does that help me in any Wait, way? He's it's only got a seven. seven. Oh, he doesn't minus have one. a... Minus one. Minus one. Oh, that's right. The minus one. I cannot re-roll that. Oh, oh, that's oh my God. Oh, that's oh a my God. Failure. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, wait, are we doing? That's just a house roll, isn't it? That we no, can't re-roll one. That's nope. canon. They made it canon. Oh, canon now. So <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> that's it. In this session, you're, you're picking. Yeah, you're picking your way over these crevasses, uh, Dolores. You look up, and uh, I think what happens yeah. is he's hastily just grabs the thing. Yeah. And I see it happening. Grant sees it happening. He's like, "Oh shit." So he like he jumps in to try and help him, but he like can't find a good spot to hold it fast enough, and he just keeps lifting. So like the way to this thing, is, <laughs> it's how are you back. gonna put this on me, dude? <laughs> how are you gonna put this shit on me? Hey, you rolled first. You, you rolled fucked first. that up. Okay. You rolled first, and you rolled well. Here's and the, then the weight just goes on to me, and I can't handle it. The thing is, Alex, you didn't just roll a failure; right. you rolled a critical so failure. So I'm dead. So the ground slips underneath you. Uh, okay. It like buckles. It starts to like fall down i think you don't even have time to let go of it and kane you watch in horror as grant and the thing that could let you retire fall into the chasm below is there any way i can make an agility roll to stop grant from falling what if we both have to do it i will let you both make an athletics roll at negative four because we already step we already established the stakes of this okay. the stakes were that we were going to lose the thing not that i was going to die hold until on, you roll on. the crit failure right. buddy let's okay on, guys baby. to set the stakes though unless both of you succeed because we already set the stakes you're going to fall so to let you do this if you fail kane's fallen too
Music on the show was by Rudy Zuniga, Levi Rojas, or Caleb Sunstead. I'm Caleb, your GM or Marshall, and you can find me on Twitter at Marshall Caleb. You can also find me and the rest of the crew on our regular podcast, Sounds Like Crows, at Sounds of Crows on Twitter. Boudreaux was played by Cameron Reed, and you can find him on Twitter at CJReed211. Doc Soren was played by Marshall Sims at Mr. Malicious One on Twitter. Cameron Day played Kane, and you can find him on our Discord server at patreon.com forward slash sounds like crows. Grant Hildebrand was played by Alex Horrell, and you can find him at sasquatch at gmail.com. Ranger Day was played by Isaac Sunstead at Able to Crow on Twitter. Savage Worlds and Deadlands the Weird West are owned by the Pinnacle Entertainment Group. You can find them at peginc.com. Special thanks to Shane Hensley, Matthew Cutter, Simon Lucas, and Jody Black. All right, y'all, that's it.